Bismillah Rahman and Rahim. Um, I am very happy to be here and to be talking to you this afternoon. Um, I don't have to introduce myself because uh, Mr. Tehrani has told you about my interests. I am um, particularly concerned about Europe, uh, intellectual life in the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. And um, in this period, I can tell you straight away that um, um, works, um, ideas um, of um, authors who were writing in Arabic um, were really at the center of European intellectual life. Um, and uh, whether this is in philosophy or in science or in medicine um, or in other, work, uh, other areas like alchemy, magic, um, Arabic name, uh, authorities with Arabic names, many of them indeed from Persia, but writing in Arabic um, were dominant in European intellectual life. And this is something which um, has become fo forgotten in later ages. Um, their works became so embedded in European scientific philosophical literature that they were not recognized anymore in the early modern and more modern periods. Um, and I would like this afternoon just to give you some idea of the interest in works written in Arabic um, during this um, period, the Middle Ages of Europe, um, why people were interested in them, what they did with them, and how they transmitted these texts to the European uh, centers of learning. I start off with a picture of um, Bath, uh, the famous uh, originally Roman spa uh, medical center where you went for healing um, because the waters, the spa waters were just so healthy. Um, you can see the Abbey of Bath in the distance there over the, um, the original Roman baths which were restored in the late 11th and early 12th century. And it was just at this, about this time that someone called Adelard um, was born and raised in Bath and somehow or other he got the idea that the Arabs had something to contribute. Um, he was disappointed with the standard of learning that he found at that time, um, especially in, the in, in Paris, which was the main center, uh, well, Paris and the European, um, the French cathedral schools, which is where, um, which were the main centers of learning at the time. Um, and he came to uh, an arrangement with his nephew, we don't know his name, it's just called a nephew, and he said to him, you stay, in this cathedral school, it was long, just to the northeast of Paris, and I shall go um, and spend seven years traveling um, in pursuit of Arabic learning. Um, and we can see, in fact, the, um, his story about how he did this, because when he came back from this seven-year trip, he met his nephew again to see whether he had learned more from the Arabs than his nephew had from his French teachers. And he wrote this work called um, On Natural Questions. And I don't know, can we um, darken the room a little bit more so that we can see? Um, but on the first page of this printed edition of the text, which is from the uh, end of the 15th century, he says somewhere down here um, how he went to learn something of the um, Arabic studies, aliquid. Arabicorum Studiorum. Um, and we know where he went. First of all, he went to Sicily, um, which had been in the hands of the Arabs for two centuries, up to the middle of the 11th century. And then he went to the Middle East, at the very begin of, uh, beginning of the 12th century. We know that he was in Antioch. We know he was in Tarsus and Mopsuestia in modern-day Turkey. But in those peri that period, um, these were towns within the uh, Crusader Principality of Antioch, but it was where there was Arabic learning. And we have his um, accounts of uh, conversations that he had with local philosophers and doctors. And he brought all this information back to England and wrote it down in this book called On, the Nat on Natural Questions, one might say on physics. But he also started on um, um, uh, um, a task 
of translating into Latin um, works in a field in which the um, Western scholars at that time knew very little, i.e. in astronomy and mathematics in general. And he started by translating a work which is probably familiar to you, and the first work in geometry by Euclid, the great um, uh, uh, um, Greek geographer of the second century, ge geometry, geometer of the second century AD, um, which had been translated into Arabic in the ninth century AD, and um, Adelard found this Arabic version of Euclid's elements and translated it into Latin. And this was the foundation for, um, let's say, um, a course in astronomy. Um, he then translated some astronomical tables um, by an Arabic scholar, Al-Khwarizmi, um, of the early 10th century, who um, um, made uh, tables um, showing the movements of the planets and the sun and the moon, and based on Indian learning, because the Indians at the time were uh, the foremost astronomers, and their tables were translated into Arabic. Then Adelard of Bath translated these astronomical tables into Latin, and they became the first set of tables whereby you could predict very accurately um, where any of the planets and the sun and the moon would be at, on any day at any time during the year. And you could predict, for example, when, you, uh, when eclipses would occur. Um, this um, is the early manuscript, the earliest manuscript of these tables, um, written in, in fact, the Cathedral of Worcester um, in about 1130 AD. Um, and they give the instructions on how to use the tables. And we can see from the very beginning um, the book of the tables, Liber Ezik, Zich in Arabic, um, Al Khwarizmi. And there's the author, which Adelard has simply transliterated into Latin, Al Khwarizmi. Um, and then he said, translated by Adelard of Bath. And one thing that is interesting is that whenever there's an, uh, an Arabic word, an Arabic term, and indeed there are many Arabic terms because there were just no Latin equivalents for these terms, um, he had put the Arabic word in red just to show this comes from the Arabic. Um, and it starts off with al-Muharram, the, the month of al-Muharram, for example, which is, uh, is in Arabic. Um, and uh, you can also see um, the word um, for the most important work on astronomy of the time, uh, written by Ptolemy in Greece in the second, in Alexandria, in fact, in the second century AD, but known only in its Arabic version, which Latin scholars then um, undertook to translate. So we have the Almagest, um, the Arabic title of, um, um, here of Ptolemy's work, um, um, which was one of the sources for Al Khwarizmi. Now, Al Khwarizmi is known not only for writing um, um, uh, astronomical tables, but also, but for two more reasons. First of all, he invented, as it were, um, the science of algebra. Because algebra itself comes from the word al-jabr wa al um, uh, two Arabic words meaning putting together and comparing. Um, and this new way of doing mathematics using um, you, 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 um, using um, um, uh, unknown qualities, which we represent by A and B and less of the alphabet, um, finding out the value of X, X itself being the first letter of the Arabic shy thing, um, when it's written in um, a Spanish transliteration. This was um, the work, one work that al Khwarizmi was well known for, and later on, after Adelard's time, his work on algebra was translated twice into Latin and became the foundation for Western algebra. But the other thing that al Khwarizmi did was to introduce to the Arabs the way the Indian um, numerals, um, the, uh, which were very special because they were the first numerals 
which had place value, um, i.e. Um, by using only nine numerals, you could represent absolutely any number depending on where you put that numeral. I need hardly explain this in detail, but if you put a two, um, just on its own, it will be a two, but if you put it um, in, a, um, in a position so that it has a zero after it, it will be a 20. If you put it in a position where it has two zeros after it, it will be 200 and so on. So a two can mean anything depending on the position of where, of, uh, where depending on its position. And al Khwarizmi introduced this Indian way of writing numerals and calculating with them, which in turn was translated into Latin. Um, and in fact, it was a pupil of Adelard um, who made the first attempt to describe, to describe the method by which you did mathematics um, using these Indian numerals. And he called it the Helsef, which is a hisab in Arabic, the calculation al Saracanicum. You can see the Saracanicum a little bit further down here. Um, so the Saracen way of doing mathematics. Um, and um, there it is, Saracanicum. And we see, um, soon after the time of Adelard, we see tables explaining the meanings of these Indian Arabic numerals. We call them Arabic numerals because they came immediately from the Arabs, but it's more accurate to call them Hindu Arabic numerals because they originated with the Hindu Indians um, and then were transmitted via the Arabs to the West. And the most difficult thing is to understand the place value, that these, these symbols have place value. Um, and so you have a table like this, where you have the nine Indian Hindu Arabic numerals, let's call them one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And you show that you can place them either in the position of one, unus, position of ten, um, position of a hundred, position of a thousand, position of ten thousand, and so on, at, uh, in, uh, to infinity. Um, and, um, and so here you see their equivalents in the Roman numerals. And we can see another table here where you just see, again, the um, decimal places from 1, 10, 100,000 and so on. Um, and the fact that um, for any of these decimal places, you can use one of the Hindu numerals. Um, I've just um, added one more table because the Indian numerals, or the Hindu Arabic um, numerals, in fact, um, took two forms. One form which was distinctive of the west part of the Mediterranean, that is Spain and North Africa, or Al-Andalus, if you like, the Arabic, um, um, the is Islamic uh, area of Spain. And the other is distinctive of the east. And the eastern forms of the Arabic numerals, which you see here in a manuscript from Sicily, in fact, um, are more like the Arabic numerals which are used in the Arabic world. Um, uh, in the Islamic world um, um, these days, you can just say, see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Um, so we have these two forms. Now, um, just before Adelard went on his voyage to Sicily and to Antioch, coming back to Bath, where he translated these texts from Arabic into Latin, mainly on astronomy, and geometry, um, there was um, somebody else called Constantine who came from Kairouan um, in present-day Tunisia. Um, and um, he must have arrived at the uh, main center for Western medical learning at, at Salerno in southern Italy in about 1060 or so. Um, and the story is that he was so disappointed in the level of medical learning at this foremost centre in the West um, as a school of medicine that he went back to Cairo um, and he fetched a large number of Arabic manuscripts written in Arabic um, and brought them back to Salerno and soon after that 
to the monastery of Monte Cassino, which is what, what you see here, where he proceeded to translate them into Latin and to establish for the first time in the West, um, after the Casper period, um, a, a medical curriculum. Um, so this was a great transformation of the quality of medical knowledge based entirely on works written in Arabic. The main work um, was um, a work called the Kamil um, Asna'a uh, Tibiya, um, the perfect book um, on the medicine, uh, on, the, on the science of medicine, and written by someone called Ali ibn al Abbas al Majusi. And the name Majusi um, indicates that he was of Zoroastrian origin, at least his family was Persian and would have been of the Zoroastrian religion. He wrote in Arabic in the 10th century um, this compendium of 10 books on the theory of medicine and 10 books on the practice of medicine, which Constantine the African translated to be the first um, complete book on medicine written in Latin in the Middle Ages. And um, he called it indeed the Pantegni, which is um, a variation of the Greek word meaning the whole of the art. Um, and because he was working in this large monastery, in fact the uh, mother house of the whole of the Benedictine order, a very important monastic order in the West, he had the resources of scribes, of illustrators, um, of people who could make, produce many beautiful manuscripts which were then distributed throughout Europe. And this is one copy, which actually is in Cambridge um, University, you have the Trinity College of, um, Library, um, and you can see how beautifully it has been um, executed. We see here the book of Pantegni. These are the chapters of the book, or the first book of the whole 20 books. Um, and we have uh, insipid in here, the first chapter of the first book begins. And this is the dedication to the abbot um, of the monastery of Monte Cassino, um, just telling him uh, how important this work is. Now, Constantine um, um, began, also was translating works um, of local um, African um, doctors writing in Arabic, Ibn al-Jazar um, and Ishaq al-Israeli, a Jew in fact, writing in Arabic, both from Kairouan, um, and uh, also another one called al-Imrani, who wrote a work on melancholy. Um, and this whole body of works was transmitted uh, from um, the, uh, uh, the monastery of Monte Cassino um, to various parts of Europe and really established the medical um, curriculum in the, um, of the late 11th and early 12th century. Um, in fact, uh, Constantine didn't quite finish translating this enormous book um, by Ali ibn al-Abbas, which he called the Pantegni. It was finished somewhere else, and you recognize where it was, Pisa. Um, and Pisa, um, we're now in the first um, quarter of the 12th century, um, was also a very important place for the transmission of knowledge, both of Greek texts translated into Latin, but also of Arabic texts, Pisa, it was a great um, trading town, um, city, from the Arno, um, which was navigable at that stage. Its fleets went throughout the uh, Mediterranean, and it had um, entrepôts in various ports throughout the Mediterranean, including in Antioch, where Adelard of Bath had been. And so it was able to collect not only um, valuable um, uh, items of trade, food and medicines, and artifacts of various kinds, but also books. Um, as for the artifacts, I mean, you can just say, see here a little statue, no, sorry, here, a little statue, which if you look closely, you'll find that it is what we call the Pisan griffin, which is a large Arabic um, monstrous uh, bird, um, 
uh, which was captured, in fact, in the late 11th century and put on top of the cathedral. Um, and it's been proved quite recently, in fact, that this is a, um, a machine for making loud noises. It's got a kind of contraption inside, which when the wind blows, uh, you have a very loud sound coming out of the mouth of this monster, which we call a piece of griffin. So this is just one indication of um, the um, arrival or the capture of works, um, artifacts from Islamic lands in Pisa. Um, but uh, one thing that we know is that somebody who originated in Pisa, called Stephen the philosopher, went to Antioch, um, and that because Antioch was such a cosmopolitan <coughs> land where we had Arabs, Greeks, Armenians, Georgians, and various others, um, he was able to um, take some Arabic works and translate them into Latin. Here is a manuscript um, of a work by Ibn al Haytham, um, one of the best known Arabic um, writing uh, mathematicians. Um, who is best known for establishing the science of optics. Um, and here is a work um, for the Ilm al Haya, on the Ilm al Haya, which is the construction, the configuration of the universe, how um, the whole universe is, the universe is fit together, the, um, the, um, the um, orbits of the planets, the highest. Um, um, sphere where the fixed stars are and 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 the um, and what happens on the face of the earth in terms of um, seasons of earthquakes of various other things and this work was translated as the first translation of this new science of cosmology um, introduced um, through the text of um, uh, Ibn al Haytham. Um, when we're talking about the, the wholesale um, introduction of Arabic learning into Europe, um, we tend to think especially of Toledo. Toledo was, or became, um, the main place for this transmission of learning. Um, Toledo had always been, um, let's say, the ecclesiastical um, center of Spain, even before Spain fell to the Arabs in the early 8th century, to the Muslims, one should say, in the early 8th century, um, and Al-Andalus was set up. Um, in 1085, the Christians, who had been advancing southwards in Spain, reconquered Toledo and established it as its kind of the Christian capital and ecclesiastical center. Um, but it was still very close to the border of Islamic Spain, Al-Andalus. There were many um, um, Arabic speakers, but most, in fact, most of the, uh, uh, the population of Toledo spoke Arabic, uh, at least as their uh, intellectual language. Um, there were many manuscripts, um, and there were many um, contacts uh, between um, Arabic scholars and Christian scholars, and in fact Jewish scholars who had been brought up in an Arabic um, uh, environment, Arabic being their language of scholarship. Um, so from 1085 onwards, and especially in the, um, from about 1120, we see evidence of um, scholars coming to Toledo from other parts of Europe looking for Arabic learning, realizing that Latin learning, that the learning of the Latin West was far inferior to La Arabic learning, looking for these texts and getting them translated. Um, the most important of these people um, was Gerard, someone called Gerard, who was an Italian from Cremona, born in 1114, who um, um, came to Toledo looking for this greatest of works on astronomy, um, Ptolemy's Almagest, which he knew he would find in Arabic. Um, but once he arrived there, he found so many works on so many different subjects that he spent the right rest of his life, until he died in 1187, um, translating through uh, the, the best, he says, the flower 
of these works. And then after he died in 1187, his students drew up a whole list of what he had translated, and it's truly um, remarkable. He translated more than 70 works. Uh, first of all, works of medicine, because he himself seems to have been educated as a doctor. Um, he was the first person to translate Ibn Sina's Canon of Medicine, this great work of medicine, which eventually took the place of the text translated by Constantine the African, the Pantechni, and became the main text on medicine studied in the European universities from the 13th century onwards. It was printed many times. Many, uh, we have many um, commentaries uh, on the, what was called the Canon of Medicine, Canon Medicinae of Avicenna, the Canon Filtib in Arabic. So he was responsible for introducing this work. But aside from that, he introduced um, works by the great um, Arabic uh, doctor um, Abu Bakr ibn Zakaria Arazi from Rai, uh, outside present day Tehran, um, who was a great, um, who wrote a lot about his experience in hospitals. He told you exactly how to treat both um, physical and mental diseases. And these works uh, were translated by Gerard. Um, alongside Ibn Sina, but uh, Gerard was also aware of the works of doctors who lived in Spain, um, such as Ibn Wafid and uh, Abu Qasim um, al-Zahrawi, who came from um, the famous um, summer ple well, pleasure, pleasure palace of Abdurrahman III, just outside Cordova. Aside from medicine, um, Gerard translated works on the full range of mathematics, starting from another, another translation of Euclid's Elements, for example, but uh, many works on uh, arithmetic, on geometry, on algebra, on trigonometry, and especially on astronomy. Um, another area was philosophy. And here, in the middle of the 12th century, we start finding, um, uh, realizing, people realized that the greatest of the ancient philosophers was Aristotle, but they had very few works of Aristotle in Latin. So um, there was an effort made to translate the works of Aristotle on natural science, on metaphysics, on ethics, um, from Greek and from Arabic. And it was Gerard who was translating these texts from Arabic beginning at the beginning with work with a work called on the posterior analytics which told you how to do a scientific argument so it gave you the rules for scientific methodology um, and then he started translating his works on natural science beginning with his works on physics going through on generation and corruption on the heavens um, on meteorological phenomena um, etc um, now, Aristotle was notoriously difficult to understand, um, and there were two ways of um, approaching these works of Aristotle, now in their translation in Latin. One was to um, look at, again, Avicenna, Ibn Sina's own retelling of Aristotelian philosophy, what we call peripatetic philosophy, um, in what he called the Shifa, a Shifa, which means um, the, um, um, the cure, the cure from ignorance, I suppose. And various parts of the Shifa were translated by a companion um, of Gerard of Cremona in the Cathedral of Toledo called Dominicus Gundi Salvi. Uh, and this helped one to understand what Aristotle was saying. Um, the other help was to look at the commentators. There were many Greek commentators, some of whose works became known. But in particular, you had the Arabic commentators. You had Al-Farabi, again a Persian um, a scholar writing in Arabic. You had, um, um, and above all, you had Ibn Rushd, who again was a local man, Averroes, um, born and died in Cordoba died in 1199, um, uh, who was almost a contemporary of Gerard of Cremona, the great translator. 
and it was Averroes' works which were translated to be the main way of understanding Aristotle's philosophy, or one might say, you know, philosophy in general, um, in the early 13th century by scholars such as Michael Scott, working for the emperor, the Holy Roman Emperor, Frederick II in Sicily, another place where you have Arabic and Latin and indeed Greek culture side by side. Um, just before we get to Averroes, here's just a, a one example of um, a manuscript of Ptolemy's Almagest. Gerard of Cremona did uh, succeed in translating the Almagest and his version of this astronomical textbook and became the standard textbook used, or the standard version used all the way up to Copernicus when the new heliocentric um, system was introduced. This is very much a geocentric system, but based on very sound mathematics. Here's just an example of an illustration. Here's another example showing the eclipse of the sun, Sol here, and by the moon, here's Luna, so that you can't see the sun and the earth, which is there. Um, but if we go and, um, yeah, so I should also mention that we're not just dealing with the transmission of texts, but also the transmission, transmission of um, instruments which were necessary for um, different sciences. Um, one can easily imagine what instruments were necessary for medicine, for example, um, different kinds of knives for cautery. Um, uh, we have the descriptions, indeed, from Azarachasachrawi of various um, forceps and so on used for extracting fetuses and so on. But in astronomy, the main instrument that was used for um, taking measurements was the astrolabe. And um, not only do we have um, um, examples of Arabic astrolabes and their Latin um, um, and the Latin astrolabes, which were based on the Arabic astrolabes, um, but we also have texts on how to make the astrolabe, how to use the astrolabe. And here's an example from London, in fact, is an Arabic astrolabe in the Khalili collection, not so far away from here. So one must never forget that, aside from texts, we have instruments. Um, but here, to go back to the great... Um, um, the story of the transmission of philosophy. Here we have a 13th century manuscript of um, the physics of Aristotle, the first work that he studied if you wanted to know about natural science. Um, the Latin text itself is translated from Arabic, from, 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 from Greek rather, and there's some very interesting illustrations here, including Aristotle um, teaching. Um, there were also books being burnt. We don't quite know why the books are being burnt. There was some controversy about whether Aristotle's works were compatible with Christianity, indeed, as whether they were compatible with Islam and Judaism. And also, you have the fight up here. But in the margin, you have the commentary of Averroes um, um, uh, in two columns on each side, just discussing the meanings of, these, of this ancient Greek text. Um, and Averroes was so well known that um, it was sufficient to put a little, or a big C at the beginning of every comment here, which was short for commentator. The commentator said uh, that was the definitive um, um, interpretation of Aristotle's text. And just to um, the, these works of Aristotle were brought together in large volumes, um, studied in the European universities. Everybody had to study philosophy as part of the arts course. Um, but there were some Arabic um, works, originally Arabic, included in this corpus as well. And here we have a work by someone called Kushta ibn Luka, who in fact was a Christian um, uh, in Baghdad in the ninth century translating works from Greek or Syriac into Arabic and writing his own work on the difference between the spirit and the soul. The spirit being um, a corporeal entity within the body which was responsible for um, various activities of the body like the five senses, like digestion, um, like breath, like breathing, 
Um, and the soul was an immortal um, part of the body which determined the character of the individual um, and was subject, of course, to uh, morality. Um, and at the time of the death of a person, the spirit and the soul, here depicted as two little naked um, creatures, um, a male and a female, um, left the mouth of the, um, the dead person and ascended to God on high. So the work by Gustav Ibn Luker on the difference between the spirit and the soul was a very important work included in this corpus for every university student um, from uh, the late 12th century right through to the 15th, 16th century would have read this work as well. Um, by the time you come to the Renaissance, the time of printing, um, which of course starts in the middle of the 15th century with Gutenberg, um, these texts, which were translated in the Middle Ages, were printed. They were published. Um, and here we have Constantine's Pantegni and all these other texts which have been translated in Monte Cassino in the 11th century. Um, and we can see in the frontispiece of this book um, the origins. You have Isaac Israeli, um, the supposed author of the original Arabic texts. You have um, Ali, or some of the Arabic texts, you have Ali ibn al-Abbas al-Majusi, the author of um, the um, Kamil Fitzina um, al um, uh, the origin of the Pantechni text itself. And here we have Constantinus Monachus, the Latin translator. So people were aware when they were reading these texts of their origins. Here we have in the early 16th century, 1508, a whole collection of texts by Avicenna. You can see Avicenna here, um, of his Shifa, um, his logic, his physics on the, on the heavens and the, world, and the earth, on the soul, on animals, on intelligences. Um, and here we have a work by Al-Farabi, again on inter intellects or intelligences, um, and Al-Farabi's, um, I think this is Al-Kindi philosophy. Um, the first philosophy, but Al-Kindi was also an Arabic philosopher whose works were known in the West. And perhaps the culmination of this integration of Arabic learning in the West um, was um, a collection of 11 volumes published in Venice in 1550 to 1552, which uh, were all the works of Aristotle with all the commentaries of Averroes, an enormous work, not um, all in translation, not in Arabic or Greek, but in Latin translation, sometimes it, with several translations. In fact, if you turn and uh, look in the book itself, you will see two translations of part of Aristotle, and then you have the long commentary of Averroes on this section of the physics of Aristotle. Um, to um, and then, uh, about the same time, early 16th century, we have some new translations made from Arabic. In this case, some more texts by Avicenna, Ibn Sina, um, a work by the, um, Ibn Sina on the soul, translated by someone called Andrea Alpago, um, who was working as a doctor in Damascus with the, um, with the Venetian um, embassy in Damascus. Um, but at about this time, in the mid-16th century, we start having an interest in Arabic texts in themselves, not as contributors to the learning of Europe in general, but um, as something a bit exotic, something new, something different. And we have for the first time an interest, for example, in Arabic poetry. We have, towards the end of the 16th century, starting in 1580, the first Arabic press um, established in Rome by the Medici um, and um, directed by someone called Gian Battista Ram, um, Raimondi. Um, and this was at a time when no Arabic press, printing press, existed within the Ottoman world, as it was then. Um, and, um, and so many of the texts, including Ibn Sina's Canon of Medicine, were printed in Rome and then, in fact, exported to the Arabic world. Um, and this saw the beginning of what we might call 
uh, Arabic or Oriental studies in Europe. Um, but sadly, one might say, the beginning of the study um, of focusing on the Islamic world as something different, um, something which we could isolate from Western culture, was uh, represented the end um, of the realization that Western culture in itself was so, so um, um, indebted to um, what Arabic authors had contributed in the Middle Ages and early Renaissance. So, thank you very much.